Hello, everyone. So happy to have this wonderful guest tonight, Karma Lekshe Somo, who many of us know, I think, uh, from many places. I know her from Brasilia, of course, from the amazing Tara Mama we did there, um, where a bunch of us went to see her presentation on women in Buddhism. And she had photos of us dancing in the mama, like taken that day in her presentation. I just thought, okay, I curve all with this person. And um, I don't wanna do any kind of formal introduction. I just wanna let you introduce yourself. And um, I asked uh, her to speak on the topics of white Tara, uh, the meaning of mama and women in Buddhism. So we'll see what, what we get back. So Lekshay, please. Uh, greetings to everyone, Tashi Dele, and aloha from Hawaii. I'm here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, and I'm so happy to see so many beautiful faces, beautiful hearts, and many of whom I know. Oh, Prashwal and all those in here, and so many wonderful people from that our programs two programs I attended down in Brazil with the Taradatu. And it's amazing that you have all so wonderfully kept the programs going, working from the heart. It shows that we can work in new ways. We can work from the heart and we can work with loving kindness and compassion and we can change the world. Um, I think we're doing that. and. It's a crazy time to be living. They're calling it a collective traumatic event. And um, all of us are challenged to the maximum of our capabilities. But of course, this is a gift. This is an opportunity. If we are not challenged, we would stay just where we were. If we're to grow, we have to push beyond our capabilities. So this is an opportunity. We can see it as a disaster, which it is. And we can also understand it as a marvelous, once in a lifetime opportunity. So I'd like to begin with generating a pure motivation. You know, at the beginning of every Buddhist practice, we begin by adjusting our motivation. Check up. Why are we doing this? There's so many things vying for our attention. Why are we taking two hours today to talk about our spiritual growth? to talk about the awakened being we are becoming. Why? Well, it could be because we just want to inflate our ego. It could be because we want to impress people. Oh, guess what I did today. Um, it could be because we don't have anything better to do with our time. Or it could be that we wish to achieve perfect awakening in order to liberate all living beings from suffering. Obviously, you'll see I have a slight bias. <laughs> I have a dog in this fight. <laughs> Clearly. Um, according to the teachers I've studied with over the years, there's no contest. Obviously, the highest motivation would be in order to become perfectly awakened in order to liberate all living beings from suffering. So this is what I say about our historical moment. Right now, we have the sad opportunity of seeing unbelievable suffering throughout the world. And it is a disaster. But it is also an amazing unprecedented opportunity for us to understand the true nature of suffering. Suffering and impermanence. 
people were quite comfortable. We were all getting a little bit comfortable, weren't we? Ah, things will get better and better. I will, you know, continue with my practice and my dance, my chants, my friends, my Dharma friends. Maybe we were getting just a little bit comfortable and wham. Suddenly we're not out of our complacency. And we have to recognize the sufferings in the world. When we have enough to eat, when we have a safe place to live, we forget about the millions who are not so comfortable, eh? So now suffering has been brought right into our own front yard, not backyard, front yard. And we have to deal with it. So what tools do we have for dealing with this unprecedented collective traumatic event? Well, we have so many resources um, in the world's wisdom traditions. And in the Buddhist traditions alone, we have 84,000 different methods to help us liberate ourselves. So ultimately in this system, we're responsible for liberating ourselves. No easy fix. <laughs> we have to do the work, but we have many tools. 84,000 tools to work with. So we're very fortunate, extremely fortunate to have access to all this richness of Dharma tools. Dharma methods, they call skillful means, skillful means. And we can pick and choose. We can use those means that we find work best for us. But the very important thing from the very beginning is to check our motivation and make sure we're doing this not just for our own selfish benefit, not even just for the benefit of our friends and family. Of course, they will benefit. Of course, we will benefit. No question about it. But the highest motivation then would be let's go for the let's go for the ultimate goal, achieving perfect awakening out of compassion for suffering sentient beings. So I'll chant the prayer of going for refuge and generating the bodhicitta, the awakened awareness, the altruistic motivation um, and determination to achieve full awakening in order to become fully awakened ourselves in order to liberate all beings from suffering. And if you know the chant, please chant along. If you're muted, you can chant as off key and as loud as you want or as soft as you want. Or if you'd like to turn it on and chat together, most welcome. Sange chudam so ki cho nama chang chu padu dagni kapsu chi dagi chin so ki pisu nam ki. Tola penche sange du parsho sange chidan so ki cho nam la chang chu padu dagni kapsu chi dagi jin so ki pisu nam ki Trola penche sange du parsho. Sange chidang so ki chog nam la. Chang chu vadu dagni kam su chi. Nagi jin so ki pisu nam ki. Trola penche sange 
I go for refuge to the three jewels until I become awakened to the awakened ones, their teachings, and the spiritual community. By virtue of the practice of generosity and the other perfections, may I achieve the state of perfect awakening in order to liberate all living beings from suffering. Wonderful. Okay. So that they say that generating this pure thought, this bodhicitta, the thought of awakening, is just even one time makes our whole life worthwhile. Hmm. So now we've done it. So wonderful. So we rejoice in that and feel happy. Yes. So the first um, assignment I had was to discuss the term munlam. Munlam. Munlam is often translated as prayer. But it's different from the kinds of prayers that we might find in some other spiritual traditions. Prayer can mean many things to many people. But to many people, Prayer means praying for a new job, praying for a new house, praying for a new car, praying for a new partner, <laughs> praying to pass the exam. Mm -hmm. um, or if we're a little bit elevated, we might pray for world peace. Mm, that's a good one. Now, in the Buddhist traditions, and they are multiple, here, I'm going to present today a traditional perspective because I'm trained traditionally. And the Buddhist traditions have been evolving over the last 2,500 years, beginning in Nepal, right, Asha? <laughs> beginning in Nepal. Yeah. Um, where the Buddha to... was born, right? That's yes. Just, yeah, that's I can't say. But, you know, Nepal doesn't keep carry on. So Tibet is the one who carry on and it frees up, so. Yes, it's true. But I should think that, I mean, I am grateful to Nepal for all many hundreds of years, maybe 1500 years of Buddhist development because they kept many sacred sites and many sacred texts. And now we see a revival of Buddhism in Nepal um, not only among the Himalayan peoples that we could expect, uh, but also among the Tibetan refugees in Nepal, and also among the Newar community of the Kathmandu Valley. Uh, tens of thousands of people are practicing as we speak. And now the sacred sites are being revived. Um, remodeled, you could say, rebuilt even. So I feel very happy uh, about what's going on in Nepal. There are new education programs to inform people around Buddhism. And of course, we could say that even many Hindus practice Buddhism covertly. They may not call it Buddhism, but they respect all the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, and they bring it into their own Hindu practice. These are labels, right? So in any case, being traditionally trained, I sometimes I joke that I'm the fall guy for the tradition. I just tell it like it is and then let people make their own adjustments, adaptations, and so forth. But I feel that if we um, are going to adapt Buddhism successfully to the modern day, to Western societies that we need to know what we're working with. What was what did the original look like? If we start adapting before we understand the tradition on its own terms, we might just be making it up as we go along, right? So we're fortunate to have 
a living tradition. We're fortunate to be born in a time when a Buddha appeared. Do you know how fortunate you are? Huh. And to be born into a time when the teachings are still alive. We still have the text. Not only we have the text, but we have people who understand the texts and can teach the texts. We have people who are ready to support the practice of the practitioners. These are all very rare and precious opportunities. We're so fortunate to be born as a human being, not as a hell being or an animal or a hungry ghost, or even a god. You know, the gods are having too much fun. They don't think too much about meditation because they're having a good time. <laughs> so to be born as a human being is seriously as good as it gets, but not just any human being, because as we mentioned, a third of the human beings on planet Earth are going to go to bed hungry this evening. So we're the fortunate ones. Everybody ate today? Very good. Very fortunate. Um, we have our senses intact. I assume that because you're sitting in front of the screen, you, your mental faculties are still working <laughs> and your eyes are still working, ears still working, mouth still working. Fantastic. Okay. We're the lucky ones. So building on this good fortune, we have an opportunity to study and practice. Um, these amazing wisdom traditions. Um, not just Buddhism, if you are a Sufi or a Hindu or a Christian or a humanist secularist, good on you. Carry on, carry on. All religions are good as long as we practice them, right? <laughs> practice them in a constructive way. Now, mun lam, lam means path, mun means aspiration. So the Buddhist understanding of what we call prayer is a little different from praying for stuff. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with praying for stuff. It can create the conditions to actually actualize stuff. There's even one Buddhist group in Japan. It's gone international. They seriously pray for stuff and they get it. So kagaka. But ideally, what we're doing here is generating aspirations. May I be kind, may I be wise, may I be healthy in order to benefit others, right? And then we already talked about the highest aspiration, the aspiration to become perfectly awakened. What do we mean by perfectly awakened? Well, it means to be free from all of the mental defilements, Greed, hatred, ignorance, pride, jealousy, all that other junk, all that other garbage of the mind, the bad habits that incline us to get involved in unwholesome actions. These predispositions that may have been created either in this life or previous lifetimes incline us to be greedy, be unkind, um, to be lazy. Mm -hmm. So we want to clear out all of those bad habits. We're going to change track here. We're going to change our karma. Mm -hmm. We're going to change our minds. It's within our power, entirely within our power. And that's what the Buddhist practices are all about. They're about transforming our minds. We might have different bodies in different lifetimes, male, female, large, small, beautiful, not so beautiful, of this ethnicity or that ethnicity, of this complexion or that complexion. But, or we might even be born in an animal body. Yeah, I say it's possible. That was the first question I ever asked the Dalai Lama. You know, I went to study, well, maybe I should start at the beginning um, about how I got into this. My family name was Zen. And as a little kid, about 11 years old, I read two books on Buddhism and said, that's it, home free. This is what I want to do. 
And I was fortunate because I grew up in a very fortunate uh, environment financially. Growing up in Malibu with all the celebrities and all that. <laughs> but I looked around and I saw that most of these people were not looking very happy. There were so many problems. And so I thought, hmm, obviously money is <laughs> not the solution. When I read the books on Buddhism, that was it. I had been searching for something like this, and I, there it was right in my own little childish hand. Now, it took me many years to find my path, many years of searching, many trips to India, many attempts to find a teacher and systematic presentation of the teachings. But finally, I arrived in Dharamsala in 1972, before some of you were born. And there was the Dalai Lama was teaching Buddhism, and he had appointed some excellent teachers, lamas, for us. Small band of beatniks. <laughs> We didn't call ourselves hippies. We were beatniks. Or maybe we didn't even take a label, but we were Dharma aspirants. We all discovered this path and loved it and wanted to follow it. And here were these teachers given four hours of Buddhist teachings every day, six days a week. I mean, what a blessing. We were so lucky. And the Tibetans were looking at us. Why is the Dalai Lama appointing His Holiness? Of course, they never say just Dalai Lama. That's quite rude. His Holiness, the wish fulfilling Him. Why is He appointing the, these highest teachings for this bunch of strange looking people? But His Holiness knew what He was doing. And out of that first group came some of the world's best translators and teachers and researchers and, and human beings. A lot of nice people. So I think um, it was there I got an interview for the first time in 1972. And I had just completed a master's thesis on emptiness here at the University of Hawaii in Asian studies. And I had um, eight questions for the Dalai Lama. Sounds like a book title, doesn't it? But it would be a very short book. Let me tell you the story. I dressed up in my finest, I wasn't a nun yet, right? I dressed up in my finest Tibetan drag with my chuba and my pigtails and my coral and turquoise earrings, yeah? And I got an interview with His Holiness and I had my questions all set up. And I borrow the tape recorder for the occasion because I didn't want to miss the opportunity to listen again to his answers to my eight questions. My first question was, in some Western spiritualist traditions, they say that once you become a human being, you only evolve from there. You would never devolve to a lower state of rebirth. You would just keep going up, up, up. His answer, you can be born as anything, anytime. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, so we might assume that we're always going to draw a human rebirth, but maybe it's wishful thinking. And nothing, uh, no free lunch here. <laughs> we have to you know, on the basis of cause and effect, we have to create the causes of the results we wish to see. We can't expect that we're just going to be greedy and, and um, you know, disgruntled and lazy and, and get a human rebirth next time around. In fact, as we speak, we are in, in a way, we're exhausting the good karma that we've accumulated in the past. The fact that we've eaten today, the fact that all of you have these beautiful surroundings, um, the fact that all of you are in good health, healthy enough to show up here, and all the many other blessings that we receive is the result of our 
wholesome actions in the past. And as we experience the results of our wholesome actions, the pleasant consequences of our good karma, karma just means action, right? So the results of our good actions, wholesome actions of body, speech, and mind, now we enjoy all these benefits. But what about the future? It's like a bank account. You can't just spend, 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 and expect it to replenish itself. <laughs> no, we have to continually create wholesome actions. And we do this mentally, verbally, and physically. So, and that's some of these 84,000 teachings that the Buddha gave. There are opportunities for creating merit or wholesome karma. Okay, this will ensure our future happiness and also our present happiness, of course, and the happiness of people around us because if we're happy campers and if we're decreasing the greed, hatred, and ignorance of our minds, we're also increasing the happiness and the good fortune of those around us. So it's a win-win, right? We have everything to gain on every level. So after my first question, he said, you can be reborn as anything, anytime. Oh, okay. And next question. <laughs> my next seven questions were all about emptiness because it was really on my mind because I just finished my thesis on emptiness. And I was trying to find teachings on emptiness in the early Buddhist tradition and compare them with the teachings of Nagarjuna in the middle way philosophy. And he answered my questions in such depth and such breadth. And I was so delighted, absolutely in heaven with the answers. And we parted with great friendship and happiness. And I went back to my room, which was about as big as this table and turned on the tape recorder to hear the teachings again while they're fresh in my mind. And guess what? The tape was empty. Hmm, <laughs> totally empty. <laughs> so that was two, two story, two story. Uh, later, a few years later, when I returned to Honolulu, I was up at the Dharma Center, not far from here in Manoa Valley. And I was burning my that master's thesis because I realized it was pure garbage. that I didn't know what I was talking about. I was relying on other people's interpretations of emptiness, which were often mistaken. So I built a little fire in the backyard of the Dharma Center and I'm standing there with Nature Rinpoche and I was tossing the pages of my thesis into the fire one by one when the Honolulu Police Department arrived and busted me for open burning. <laughs> it's against the law to burn in your backyard in most places in the world. So I said, oh yes, officer, I'm so sorry and tossed the last pages into the flames. <laughs> so um, it was a good experience. It shows that we revise our understanding. We upgrade our knowledge as time goes on. We don't want to stay fixed. This is the whole meaning of emptiness, in fact. Emptiness and dependent arising are in mutually entailing. If everything were fixed, we couldn't change. We'd be stuck. We'd be stuck in our five-year-old bratty self or even before. Maybe we'd be stuck as an embryo swimming around or, you know, even before. So dependent arising means that because of this, that arises. Because of that, this arises. In other words, the law of cause and effect. And in order for the law of cause and effect to function, we need this open awareness, this open space, a lack of true or fixed identity of phenomena. Okay, we're getting into something pretty serious, but actually it's very important because 
we want to understand the true nature of things. True nature of things are not fixed. This pandemic will not last forever in its own, at least in this form. We ourselves will not last forever. Our friends, our family, our bank accounts, our situations, nothing will last forever. Um, understanding that is just basic wisdom. Huh? So what are some of the techniques that we have for practicing? So many, so many. Um, the most basic one is to learn to develop a calm, clear mind. Now, to develop a calm, clear mind is not difficult. It just means getting back to ourselves. Because our minds, in fact, are clear from the beginning. That is the nature of consciousness. The nature of consciousness is defined as sel shing rikpa, clear knowing and awareness. So that is the true nature of our mind, clear knowing. So to do that, we have many different meditation practices. The most basic is to practice awareness of breathing, anapanasati. Shall we do it for a few moments? Okay, let's sit comfortably, nice and tall, tall but relaxed. We relax comfortably into this present moment. Breathing naturally. Aware of all that is as it is. When distracting thoughts or images appear to the mind, just let them float away and come back to this precious present moment. If we're having trouble concentrating, we can use our breathing as the focus of our mindfulness practice. Simply following the natural flow of the breath as it flows out and as it flows in.
no need to make the breathing longer or shorter, faster or slower. Simply relax into the breath's natural rhythm. Become completely one with your breathing. When you're ready, slowly open your eyes. So this practice is very simple, it's very peaceful, it's very grounding. It can be practiced by anyone of any age, any religious tradition, no religious tradition. So it's a really good one to start our day with and maybe to end our day with also. It helps us to develop single-pointed concentration, which is necessary for all higher spiritual practices. We have to be able to focus, don't we? We need to be able to concentrate. It also has tremendous practical value. We can drive better, we can cook better, we can read better, we can tend to our parents better, we can tend to our children better, we can do everything better if we focus on the present moment. So this 
Anapanasati, mindfulness of breathing practice. Very useful, very helpful. Yes. Good. So back to the Munlam, then we learned that Munlam means aspiration, essentially. And Munlam Chenmo was the great prayer festival of Tibet. They would hold it every year, starting 15 days after the Tibetan New Year, which was Tibetan New Year was on the new moon, and therefore the Munlam fell on the full moon days. And you know, in Buddhist uh, cultures, the full moon and the new moon are very special times of the month. Uh, this has been scientifically documented. There are powerful things going on at the time of the full moon and the new moon. Admissions to mental hospitals are higher on these days. Admissions to police stations are higher on these days. In Hawaii, the, the rats and cockroaches come out on these days. They scuttle around. It's a high energy time. And so it's a special time for us to practice. We want to be careful, especially careful of our actions on these days. If we're cleaning, we want to be careful not to harm any living creature when we're cleaning, right? If we're playing in the garden, we want to make sure not to harm anyone at that time. The Tibetans say that whatever we do on the full moon day or the new moon day is worth 100,000 times what it's uh, ordinarily worth. So that means if we do an unwholesome action, it has 100,000 times as much wham or power. But the same is true for our virtuous actions. If we do even five minutes of meditation, we give a dollar to a beggar, or we give you know, a mouthful of food to a dog, or we say some special prayers or show kindness to people in any way, then it's 100,000 times more powerful. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of the, um, can we say, quantification of merit. And they even have a special month in the year, the fourth lunar month. And during that whole month, then everything we do is worth 100,000 times the other months of the year. We just had Happy New Year. So we can count from then to the fourth lunar month. And then, of course, the full moon and the new moon of the fourth lunar month are worth 100,000 times 100,000 times. Wow. That's so powerful. So... We pay attention, especially pay attention to our actions, which we should pay attention all the time. But especially at these times, we want to pay, pay special attention to the quality of our thoughts and our words and our actions. Yeah, and so the Tibetans in Tibet would set aside this special time on the full moon of the first lunar month and all the monks would gather from all around Lhasa. There were not that many nuns in those days. And most of them were living very far away in the mountains. So we didn't see too many nuns at the Munlam in Tibet. We saw tens of thousands of monks. Now, when the Tibetans came into exile, into India and Nepal, question? Somebody have a question? No? Then feel free to ask questions. Then they adapted this uh, ceremony, this special prayer festival to the Indian situation. And we would gather at the temple of His Holiness in Dharamsala. And there would be thousands of people there. In those days, the nuns sat behind they sat behind the monks, they sat behind the lay people, they sat behind the dogs. The position of nuns was pretty very poor in those days. 
the last 30 years, we've started a little revolution. <laughs> yes, with the founding of Sakyadita, I'll show you more in a moment. We've um, rediscovered the power of women. And we've uh, taken our place quietly, carefully, but tremendous change has come about for women in Buddhism. And now, um, you know, at the time when I was a student in Dharamsala in the 70s and 80s, nuns were not allowed to attend the great prayer festival. The Munlam was for monks only. And that was a bummer because that was the biggest donation of the year. <laughs> and the nuns were really poor in those days and they could have really used that donation. But one day I had an audience with His Holiness and I I asked him, why are nuns not allowed to attend the Munlam? He said, what? They're not attending the Munlam? Oh, they should definitely attend the Munlam. And so from that day forward, he sent out the message and nuns were allowed to attend the Munlam. He didn't realize nuns weren't attending. It was that simple. We didn't have to have a demonstration. We didn't have to, right, shout and scream. All we had to do was a word in the ear of the leader of the tradition and we took care of everything. <laughs> so now nuns can attend the munlam. And then there have now become many, many munlams because in Dharamsala only a few thousand people could fit into the temple. But in Bodh Gaya, sometimes when His Holiness teaches, we have up to a half million people gathered. And so we have now Kagyumunlam and Sakyumunlam and Ningmumunlam, so many Munlams. That's wonderful. The more pure aspirations to a, for the humanity, for peace and, and the awakening of the world, the better, right? So this is the meaning of Munlam. And we can hold our own mini Munlams. It's a good thing. Get people together to create virtue. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I travel a lot, and when I go to Taiwan, I'm often amazed. The women will get together. It's mostly women. Anyone can come. But many of these Dharma celebrations, we call them Fa Hui, it literally means a Dharma gathering, are organized by the, the women, the nuns. And they'll come to the temple for one day or two days or a whole week. And they'll start from early morning. They start from 4 sometimes, usually, 4 a.m. And then they pray until 6, have some bread key, and then they'll gather again. And they'll continue their prayers, the recitations of the texts until 11.30, and then they'll have lunch. Vegetarian, of course. No sentient being was harmed in the preparing of this meal. <laughs> and then from one o'clock, they take a small break. And from one o'clock until five, they'll continue. Sometimes into the evening as well. They'll do this spontaneously. They'll go around and find donors to sponsor the lunch, the breakfast, and then you know, have some ramen for dinner. And yeah, and it will go on for days. Imagine the merit accumulated by these, all these people. So uh, just as in Tibet, then also in Taiwan, in all Buddhist countries, we do this. Uh, so any questions so far? So, all right. Oh, you have to leave. That's okay. That's okay. You can leave when you want. This is an informal gathering. If you need to go shishi or something, you can please be comfortable. <laughs> and we'll take a, a little water in, water out break in eight minutes or now, whenever you're ready, Lakshmi. Yes. Yeah. I do well, have a um, question before I go. Of course. Sure. Thank you for this precious opportunity. It's so wonderful to see you again. I got mm -hmm. to meet you in Brazil, and it was a really, truly such a blessing. Um, so thank you. Um, 
let's see, my question has to do with uh, letting go of my attachment to wanting everyone to be relieved of suffering. Like I'm almost so attached to that, like feeling like I have to do something, you know, everybody's suffering. And, and then, you know, of course, then I just keep coming back to the practice and going, okay, well, the only thing I can do is relieve my own suffering and um, work towards awakening myself. So uh, anyway, is there anything more you can maybe help me with on that? Sure, um, I could offer some suggestions. Um, one is that um, any kind of attachment is going to lead to disappointment. We know that through our own experience, right? It, it, our continual grasping, craving and grasping and attachment, they're all part of a, of a continuum. They're part of a package. We desire, craving, grasping, attachment, it's all same similar emotions, right? Um, sometimes our um, desire for liberation, in fact, in Tibetan, it's a different word. Desire in English can mean many things, right? Mm. You can desire uh, material objects, desire people, even. Maybe people have become a commodity in this commodified world. Um, or we can have a desire for liberation in in Tibetan and Sanskrit and all Asian languages, that's a different, that's this aspiration, mumba, munla, that word mun is the aspiration to awaken the world or awaken ourselves. So it's a different type of thing than the kind of de desire that's lust or greed. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't be part of that cluster of emotions that I just mentioned. It would be something that is virtuous. So the aspiration for awakening for ourselves and others is a good thing. Carry on. Now the fact that people are suffering is a natural result of their actions. We are responsible for our actions. Others are responsible for their actions. Of course, our actions affect others. We know that. But ultimately, we are the owners of our karma. We create actions, wholesome or unwholesome, actions of body, speech, and mind. And we ourselves reap the results of those actions. It's just like the Bible says, we reap what we sow. If we plant a mango seed, and the conditions are ripe. It's not just about causes, it's also about conditions. That mango seed has to have proper soil, it has to have proper sunshine, proper water, and protection. We have to protect the roots of our good karma. Hmm? Don't hang out in bars on Saturday night. <laughs> conditions are not right for protecting our, our good heart. Hmm? Maybe once we get enlightened, we can go to the bar, but that's just a dream in the future. Right now, we want to protect the roots of our good karma. And then we can, we don't have to worry about the results. They will be wholesome, pleasant results. On the other hand, if we plant a pepper seed and the conditions are right, we're going to get peppers. Personally, I like peppers. Peppers are a nice thing spice up our lives. But if we plant a pepper seed, we cannot hope to get a mango, you know. <laughs> no. The result is in line with the cause. So we, res we experience the results of our own actions. That's why we want to be careful about our actions. That's why we do our meditation on breathing, because it helps us be mindful of our actions. We practice letting go of our distracting thoughts as they arise. It becomes a happy habit. We learn how to let go. So if our attachment to the results of our practice to relieve the sufferings of sentient beings is making us unhappy, then we just let go of that attachment. We can still express the wish 
that all beings be free from suffering. That's the definition of compassion. We can still express the wish that all beings be happy. That's the very definition of loving kindness. Meanwhile, we practice to eliminate, to delete the defilements of the mind. Greed, hatred, ignorance, right? Come back to the basics. And then everything will take care of itself. You know, once we're in the Dharma, everything works out one way or the other. And when obstacles arise, we have the wisdom to understand them as teaching moments, learning moments, learning opportunities, you see. An illness, ah, it's teaching us impermanent, teaching us to be aware of the impermanence of our bodies. It's a gift. Obstacles are a gift on the path. The main thing is that we can have to let go of expectations of others. We have to recognize that all expectations lead to disappointments. So expectations of ourselves as well. We expect ourselves to be too perfect and even lead to pride, arrogance, oh, and judgmentalism. Now, judgment is a good thing. We need to be able to judge what is a wholesome action, what is an unwholesome action. That's important. The Buddha did not teach us to let go of all distinctions. What is a kind word and what is an unkind word? We have to be able to, to distinguish. That's wisdom. Right? Uh, but we don't want to get attached to our self-righteousness. I'm a Dharma practitioner. Oh, look at me. We don't have to say it, but we might think it. Oh, these other people, look at them gossiping. Look at them wasting their time. Look at them carrying on, you know, whatever. Shopping, running around, whatever. We are masters at judgmentalism. But <laughs> this practice asks us to let go of all of that because we cannot change other people. We can only help them in constructive ways. Now, it's not um, attachment to give food to the hungry. It's not attachment to give a dollar to a beggar. It's a good thing, it's a good thing. And we want to give it with a happy heart, pure motivation, not, oh, who's looking? <laughs> no, we just give it from the, our pure heart and hope that they will be happy, right? Yeah. We can do that, it's a good thing. So, and it will naturally have a positive effect on those around us. Yeah, no worries. Thank so. you so much. It's so well done. <laughs> Good. So we'll take a little break now, about maybe 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and I'll show you a slideshow. Okay, yeah. so folks mute and turn off your cameras if you don't want everyone to see what you're doing or Unmute and talk, please. What this are you so doing? <laughs> Sounds I'm interesting. To facility, madam, <laughs> as you might want to, but please unmute and talk if you would like. It's it's fine, and we'll come back Let's in see. ten minutes.
Um, volta só um minutinho a tela, só para eu ativar a gravação aqui, por favor. Um, please, uh, just come back to the... Because I need just to activate the recording. Let me see if I can... Okay. There you are. Aqui estamos. Fêmea, acho que você tem que desligar o seu microfone. <laughs> Everything okay? Yep, you just start when you're ready. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so um, I'm thinking now, <coughs> I would like to show you my PowerPoint and it may raise some questions and we can also do a little um, chanting perhaps of, of um, Tara. And um, if everybody's ready to go, I will share the screen. And then Maya has her hand up. So she, oh, I don't know if you wanted to get yes. a question now or, okay, if Maya, okay, if you sure. want to yourself, yeah. Now is, now is the right time. Yes, okay. So I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> Sorry, I'm going to put on my camera so you can see me. Have you seen the Buddhist clock? It says now, 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 now. <laughs> <laughs> very good. <laughs> I'm very happy, Lakshi, to see you and hear you. I like to say to you that only listen to your voice. Uh, count, uh, count me. I think everybody. It's it's a really good, a beautiful bless to to hear you talk. And we've been going here in Brazil now uh, through a very tough situation uh, in regard to COVID. The, the, deaths, the deaths are arising. We have all the hospitals full of people. And in, in, the, in the whole society, there's still... Um, questioning whether we should stay home or if we should open the commerce and things have to to go on and i have my opinion i i know what i think it's right because i'm based on my premises of spiritual things and, and things like that and i try also to see people that don't think like me thinking that they, they have their, their own vision and their, their own purpose to think that most of the people that think that we should, the, the economy should go on and everything should be open. I know they are worried about people that don't have food, that have to work to get their living. I know that a lot of them have good intentions. That. But I have difficulty to, 
not judge them and not think that they are not doing the right uh, choice and thinking the right way, not choosing the, the right thing. <laughs> so it, it generates a lot of sadness because m m a lot of times we have close people that we love a lot and people that are our friends that have this opinion. So I, although I try to not be angry at them or get away from them and, and try to understand, inside of me, I judge them. And I like to know how do I deal with that so I can calm down a little bit and not get inside all of this this torment that we are going on right now. Well, I think that um, we should stay home. <laughs> we should stay home and stay safe, stay healthy in body and mind, and try to encourage those who are open to it to do the same. Um, it is um, very clear to us here in Hawaii that by staying home, wearing masks, closing down the bars and restaurants and, and schools. Um, it's been a, a hardship economically for the owners of these businesses and even for the state economy. But now our numbers are the best in the country. People are saying it's because of the culture here in Hawaii. We have very high Asian population, about maybe 20% Buddhist. And um, people care about each other. And sometimes we have to make sacrifices in the short term in order to uh, be healthy in the long term. We all know that. So for ourselves, if we are among the fortunate who have a place to live and enough to eat, I recommend that you stay home. Uh, because the virus is very unpredictable, and the long-term consequences seem to be quite serious, um, uh, including these mutations, which are apparently quite risky. Now, um, when we get the opportunity to get the vaccination, I think we should get it. I got vaccinated. I'm in the senior category now. So I went and I'm duly vaccinated and uh, I'm still wearing a mask and staying home. And we're fortunate to be practitioners because we know what to do with our time. <laughs> right? We can meditate or do yoga or, you know, do something useful. And uh, now we're down to less than 1% uh, of positive COVID um, incidents here. And so I, uh, and this, it, it has been difficult because the economy runs on people getting out and buying things. But we have to be cautious and here, forgive me if I offend anyone, but you know, corporate capitalism has its own motivations, right? It's happy to see us go into the mall and, and buy things. And the corporate capitalist mechanism does not particularly care whether we get sick because then they'll just sell more products. <laughs> it's um, very sad to think that people might care about their own profits more than they care about the health of the, of the nation. But that is the sad fact of the matter. Some do think like that. So now the situation of the working class who have no choice but to go out and work, and sometimes in very risky professions. Um, it, it's a, a tragedy. And um, I think that again, by staying home and staying safe and wearing masks and keeping our distance, we are protecting also those healthcare workers. By staying safe ourselves, then we won't be the one that lands in the hospital and gives them more work and more risk. This is just my personal view. 
and by staying home and generating good thoughts of love and kindness and compassion for all of the of the workers, the healthcare workers and all the workers, then we're also doing something very positive. Um, the saddest situation are the homeless. Um, over a million homeless in the United States, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. And they don't have a place to stay warm and, and stay careful and stay distant. They have to go and get food wherever they can find it. So uh, if we can help them out and help the disadvantaged, I say we definitely should, should try to do that. Yeah, there are many programs and, and blessings to them all. Blessings to all of them who, who are helping to organize services for the, for the less um, fortunate. What do you think? Anyone? I, I agree with you. Uh, what it's, it's tough for me, it's really dealing with the people that don't think like me. <laughs> but you and know, that is um... mental about not judge them in, in, a, in a bad way and say that they, they are wrong to, to think mm -hmm. in other ways. Again, we cannot really change other people, but uh, maybe in small ways. We could try to explain, but if they're not open to it, like we had a case in South Dakota, I believe, of 200,000 workers who gathered in a town and disregarding all of the protocols for the virus. And now there have been so many cases and all they got, they contracted the virus and then took it back to their hometowns. So it's a perfect example. If people would, would educate, we need to educate ourselves. And we can try to uh, influence people's opinions, but, but we cannot, um, we have to allow people to make their own decisions. We could maybe direct them to some of the statistics about how opening bars and restaurants uh, has caused the virus to increase. Um, but we, can, we cannot change other people's minds. We can only change our own behavior, set a good example, but don't hold in our hearts um, aversion or you know, judgments against them that won't really help much. Right? Try to educate in a kindly way. That's about the best we can do. And now most people are waking up and um, you know, people who live in, in mansions are very good at telling people to go out to the mall, but <laughs> we have to use our wisdom, right? <laughs> uh, so that's. Um, I also thought um, that your response to Priya to, uh, on attachment is something that I have to view my judgments of others through and say, what is, am I having an attachment to that point of view? So right. I thought your explanation of that was just like, whoa. So I'm working on that attachment issue. But also your suggestion that we can um, stay at home and do good practices like breathing. <laughs> yes. Breathing, it's great. Yes. And of course in Hawaii, we have our great gardens. So yes. that's a blessing. It is. It's truly a blessing. We are the fortunate ones. Um, and, but we don't want to hold in our hearts any un, uh, uncharitable thoughts about anyone. And sometimes people don't have access to the information or they're misinformed. There's so much misinformation out there. I mean, all these conspiracy theories and so forth. So, but letting go of attachment to views is also important. I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> that was so uncharitable, right? No, but we do want to develop wisdom and share that wisdom if people are open to it. Yeah. 
Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to share the screen now and show you my PowerPoint before time slips by. And I don't think there's any sound on this, so. Can you see the screen? Oh, wait a second. No, no, no. Here we go. From the beginning. Okay. Can you see? Yeah, perfect. Oh, good. Okay. I don't know what to do with that. Let's put it up here. Okay. So um, this is the Tara Manma. And um, so I wanted to say a little bit about Tara, who is portrayed in the Buddhist text both as a bodhisattva and as a perfectly awakened Buddha. So first she was a bodhisattva and later she became a Buddha. Um, she was originally a human being um, and she generated the intention to become a Buddha. As the story goes, which you probably all know, she was a very precocious, intelligent, kind-hearted girl. And she was really progressing well on the path. And her guy friend said, oh, it looks like you're a, ready to become completely enlightened. You should take a male body. And Tara said, well, you know, so many people have become awakened in a male body, but very few have become awakened in a female body. So I will become a Buddha in female form. And she did. So we can take, once we become even a first stage bodhisattva, we can take many forms, any form that is helpful for sentient beings. Now to become a bodhisattva is not so easy. We have to have perfect renunciation, perfect bodhicitta, and direct insight into emptiness. We talk about renunciation, now's a good time. The pandemic, we can't go to our favorite restaurants. We, if we're smart, we're not even going to the gym. We're not, you know, we're making some sacrifices. Well, that's good practice. So giving up the things we want to do is a good practice because ultimately we want to develop the thought of renouncing samsara altogether. Not just renouncing coffee, not just renouncing chocolate. We want to renounce the whole wheel of birth, death, rebirth, again and again and again, tape number nine, number nine, number nine. We want out of here. And so that's what we call renunciation. And Tara did that, okay? And she became perfectly awakened for the benefit of others. She has 21 different forms, protecting people from all kinds of adversities, from floods and famines and snake bites and all kinds of difficulties, earthquakes, all of that. So the most popular forms are green Tara and white Tara. In the green Tara form, it's supposed to move. Okay, ooh, this is very green. <laughs> I, I love to collect images, okay? In the green Tara form, she's virtuous activity. Virtuous activity. And she works very swiftly to help sentient beings. She cannot enlighten us completely. We have to do that for ourselves, but she can help in small ways. Sort of similar to Hail Mary, full of grace, help me find a parking place. Do you have that prayer? <laughs> it's a joke, but. <laughs> um, she used to help me find my contact lenses. Never forget one time my contact lens popped out in the middle of an intersection in downtown San Francisco. And I started chanting the Tara mantra and there in the, on the, road was my contact lens and I picked it up and you're not supposed to put them in your mouth but I did and popped it in and all the people in the cars that had stopped around were just <laughs> shocked <laughs> but 
This is true story, my experience anyway. Um, so Tara acts swiftly to help sentient beings. Of course, we have to have the karmic causes for those results to appear. Without causes, there are no consequences. So we have to have the wholesome causes that we've created in the past. And then if the circumstances are right, then prayers of others, including maybe the prayers of the awakened ones can help us. Okay. So um, some of the representations of Tara are so lovely, so inspiring. We can become like her, perfectly awakened, perfectly dedicated to the welfare of others. Her mantra is Om Tare Tut Tare Ture Soha. So maybe I think all of you have received this transmission, but for those of you who haven't, I will say the mantra three times and please repeat after me. Then we can say it together. I'll teach you a little tune. Okay. Om Tare Tut Tare. Today, Soha. Om Tare Tutare Today, Soha. Om Tare Tutare Today, Soha. Okay, now all of you have the transmission of the mantra of Tara, especially usually used with green Tara. And we can chant it for a few minutes. I, I know Tara um, Prema has many lovely tunes for this. And I'll teach you a traditional one. Om Tare Tutare Ture Soha. 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 So when we're washing dishes or we're scrubbing the floor or working in the garden or taking care of our loved ones, we can recite this mantra. And it creates a pleasant atmosphere and also accumulates good karma. So then we have white Tara. White Tara is associated with long life. She protects the conditions for the practitioner because if we're going to achieve awakening, we want to live as long as possible. If we're a butcher, killing living beings day by day, then maybe short life is okay. But if we want to become awakened, we want to be alive as long as possible, as long as we're hopefully healthy, in order to accum accumulate more merit, more karma, more good karma, wholesome karma by doing good deeds. So Tara, white Tara can help with this. She's very compassionate. She can help us. So we see her also in many different forms, paintings. Um, and these come especially from the Tibetan tradition. Though she is known in India, there's the text comes from India. But in Tibetan she, and tradition, she is especially popular. By Tibetan tradition, I mean also the Himalayan region of India and Nepal and Bhutan and Mongolia and Buryatia and all the Russian republics that are Buddhist. Of the 80 republics of Russia, three are Buddhist republics. And also large areas in China, people practice um, Tibetan Buddhism sometimes very quietly, but uh, it's quite popular. So lots of people are saying the mantra of 
her up. And she's also sometimes shown standing. Now, White Tara has seven eyes, the usual two eyes, also eyes in her hands, her feet, and one between her eyes, seven altogether. So you can recognize among the complex iconography of Buddhism, we can recognize Tara by these marks. Yeah. Now here is the mantra of White Tara. It's a bit longer. And um, I don't know a traditional melody for it. We usually recite it quite quickly. But let me give you this mantra also. And we'll say it syllable by syllable. So you'll also have the transmission of the White Tara mantra. Om Tare Tutare, Ture, Mama, Aya, Panya, Jnana, Pushtim, Kuru, Swaha. Om, Tare, Tutare, Ture, Mama, Aya, Panya, Jnana, Pushtim, Guru Swaha. Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Aya Panya Shunyana Pushtim Guru Swaha. So the last syllable, sometimes Tibetans pronounce Soha. In Sanskrit, it's Swaha. Let's see if we can get a melody to go with it. Om tare tutare ture mama aya panya jana pushtam kuru swaha. Om tare tutare ture mama aya panya jana pushtam kuru swaha. Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Aya Panya Jana Pushtim Guru Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Aya Panya Jana Pushtim Guru Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Aya Panya Jana Pushtim Guru Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Aya Panya Jana Pushtim Guru Swaha Om Tare Tutare Ture Mama Aya Panya Jana Pushtam Guru Swaha. Okay, so now you have the transmission of the White Tara Mantra, if you didn't have it before. It comes from a long line of teachers, from India to Tibet and throughout the world. Now that you have the transmission, you may also give it to others if they're interested. Mm -hmm. So... Um, let's start with the story of women in Buddhism from the beginning. Some of you may have seen some of these photos before, but maybe you'd like to see them again. This is Mother Maya, Queen Maya. She is the very virtuous woman who gave birth to the young prince who later became the Buddha. Uh, she was brought in, she came into this world with a special mission to give birth to a future Buddha. Very special. She was on the way to her parents' house and stopped in the forest on a tree branch, descended, and she held on to it and gave birth to the baby prince with almost no pain. Now, they say that she gave birth not from the usual channel, but from her right side. This, of course, preserves her purity and also preserves the purity of the young prince. 
feminists will have a heyday with that interpretation, but we won't go into that today. <laughs> um, she departed the scene after seven days. She passed away, dear Mother Maya. But the baby prince was raised by her sister, who later became the first Buddhist nun. And he was loved by all. Everyone rejoiced at his birth. He grew up in a palace with all of the pleasures, all the luxuries, including a harem of something like 50,000 women, plus a beautiful wife. Now, one day he saw the women sleeping, disheveled, drooling, and he arose, he, he gave rise, this gave rise to the thought of renunciation. He decided that he would leave the palace and go off to seek the meaning of life. He spent eight years in the forest and the first uh, person who offered him rice after he decided that fasting wasn't going to lead to enlightenment was a young woman named Sujata. She offered rice pudding uh, and he accepted her offering. Some think that maybe she was the first Buddhist because she was the first one there. Um, this is Mahapajapati, the Buddha's stepmother and auntie, who became the first Buddhist nun. Mm -hmm. The Buddha had many disciples, both men and women. Famous women abound in Buddhist history, but we don't have records of all of them. One record we do have is the daughter of Emperor Ashoka in India, who went to Sri Lanka to spread the teachings. And when she was there, she ordained the queen, Queen Anula, as the first Buddhist nun in Sri Lanka. It's about 300 years before Christ. She also took with her a sapling of the Bodhi tree. You see it there on the left. So she's renowned in Buddhist history. In fact, the only national holiday in the world named after a woman is Sangamitra Day. Her name was Sangamitra, and Sangamitra Day is celebrated as a national holiday in Sri Lanka to this day. Another famous woman in history is Kema. Um, I, the story is that she hid the tooth relic of the Buddha in her hair and took it from India to Sri Lanka. I don't know the karma of, of pinching a, a Buddha tooth, but anyway, she's very famous and celebrated in Sri Lanka also. The tooth is still said to be in the temple in Kandy. Now, these are the four quarters of a Buddhist society, the lay men, the lay women, the uh, monastic, so male and female. In some uh, Buddhist countries, the women's position is lower than that of the male. Here you can see it spatially. They sit lower than the nuns sitting lower than the monks. But, you know, they figure they have the opportunity to practice. They can, they can handle. Uh, unfortunately, it translates to less support for women. Um, and nuns, as you can see, they're, they've got enough to eat, but just enough. So, and traditionally, they didn't get much education, but things have changed. Now in Burma, the nuns get roughly the same education as the monks. And this has been partially as a result of our movement, our Buddhist women's movement that started in 1987. Women now do have many more opportunity, opportunities for Buddhist education throughout the world, even starting from a young age. Um, in Burma, the nuns will go for alms, but they're not allowed to cook, collect cooked food. They collect raw rice, and then they cook it in their monasteries. Uh, some say that gives them some freedom, but it is also inconvenient. So uh, this is Nepal, the famous nun of the Kathmandu Valley, uh, the Venerable Damawati, who is fearless. She's courageous. She ran away as a young girl and fled to Burma to learn Dharma. And there she got arrested on the border. But when they saw her sincerity, they, they have allowed her to go and study. 
She became a nun and she took the highest degree in philosophy that was offered at that time, came back to Kathmandu and now has tens of thousands of disciples there, including over 400 nuns, many of whom are fully ordained and doing great work teaching others, starting schools. And here is the stupa, the reliquary of Sangamitra, the one who went to Sri Lanka, the nun who went to Sri Lanka with the Bodhi tree. It's revered as a sacred site up to this day. See the Buddhist flags flying. Um, and the nuns in Sri Lanka, um, it's an option for a woman if she likes. Of course, the one, when to really choose to uh, renounce completely and go to a monastery are few in number, but they're much better supported today than they were before. Now this is uh, Vietnam, and despite a long, terrible war, there are now said to be more than 20,000 nuns, uh, fully ordained nuns in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. In Korea also, there's probably something like eight to 10,000 fully ordained nuns. This just give you an idea of the different robes. Um, they do get a good education in Korea. Some are master scholars. Now in the Tibetan tradition, this is up in the Himalayan areas of Tibet, of uh, India, an area called Zanskar. On the right, you'll see the monks monastery. On the left, can you see it? <laughs> Very small. It's the monastery of the nuns. So you can see that they get nowhere near equal support to the monks. But they're also happy to have the opportunity to practice. These are the original three who went to Tibet and got the novice ordination, brought it back to this area of Zanskar, very um, desolate, remote area and started the first monastery for nuns there. So throughout the Himalayan region, we often hear people say that Buddhism died out in India, but it never did. These people have been Buddhists since the eighth century. I mentioned in 1987, we started our work. This was our first conference in Bodh Gaya and His Holiness the Dalai Lama gave the opening ceremony. So there were 1500 people who showed up. And every two years since then, we've held a conference in a different country, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Nepal, where the Buddha's birthplace, um, Taiwan, and Korea, Malaysia, Mongolia, Vietnam, 2,400 people at that one. And Thailand again. And Vaishali, the village where the Buddhist stepmother became the first Buddhist nun. We thought we'd honor her. In Hong Kong. And then Australia. That was the most recent conference. The next one was scheduled for Borneo, for Sarawak, Eastern Malaysia, but it may go online due to the pandemic. So here we see an ancient representation of the Buddhist mother, Queen Maya, in Nepal, this image is probably at least 1,500 years old, so very precious. We also know that when the Bodhisattva of Compassion, Avalokiteshvara, went to China after about the year, about maybe the 12th century, she became female. She did a little sex change. And so images of women, now see in India, the thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara is male, and still in Tibet, it's male, but in Tibet, they also have these enlightened figures of Tara and other bodhisattvas who later become fully awakened. So these are very inspiring. Mahaprajnaparamita, um, uh, the perfection of wisdom in female form. It's said to be female. Wisdom is female. And Saraswati, the goddess of knowledge and the arts. Um, Machi Glabdon, some of them are actually um, human women. So not just imagery, iconography, but actually commemorating great female practitioners. So these days, nuns are learning. Um, uh, in many cases, they're even doing better in their studies than the 
monks. Lots of, very few young men are becoming monks in India and Nepal today. Uh, but women are still becoming nuns and they're learning all the ritual practices. They're attending international conferences. They're wearing the yellow robe, as I mentioned. They're getting better support. You can see they're getting healthier. They're learning the charm, sometimes called Lama dancing. It's meditation uh, in motion. Um, and they're happy camperists. This is the future for women in Buddhism. Uh, it's looking very promising. And in a matter of just 30 years, now coming up 33 years, that we can say, well, okay, 35 years, no, 33. Um, how much can happen? How much change can occur if we just continue uh, conscientiously uh, carry on determination? Uh, we can change our karma, we can change our minds, and we can change our society. And the younger generation now has opportunities that we didn't have. They're even learning computer skills so that they can continue studying during the icy cold winter months. And they can listen to teachings of His Holiness Dalai Lama and so many other enlightened figures, um, starting from you know, small kid time, as we say in Hawaii. This is our Sangamitra Institute. It's named after Sangamitra, the nun who went to Sri Lanka. It looks, actually got a paint job and I don't have a photo, but this is where the nuns would come and study in the winter time. In the very village where Buddha Shakyamuni achieved perfect awakening, they would come down from the Himalayan region where it's too cold to study. It's under snow and there's no water and uh, no health care, and it's really difficult to survive. So we bring them down to Bodh Gaya, and then they could study happily together and debate happily together. So um, unfortunately, this year we had to cancel because of the pandemic, but we hope that the programs will start again. Imagine if you had learned to meditate as a child. I mean, they have such a head start. Because even though they're normal kids, some of them are a little bit naughty. But by having the opportunity to study the Dharma from the age of, some of them start as young as three. I really, we're not supposed to let them in until they're eight, but they come and they're so sincere. What can I say? I can't refuse them because they're too cute. And so this was the first group of nuns who achieved the highest degree in philosophy called the Geshe degree including six of my students, and they worked so hard uh, for almost 30 years, and they did it. You know, they people used to say women are stupid, women are not used, interested in philosophy. Well, they really blew that theory to pieces. They are among the top scholars now in the Tibetan tradition, and they're going out to teach others, and they're going into retreat and doing translation, they're studying science, they're doing marvelous work. Now, the sticking point uh, in the Tibetan tradition is the full ordination of women. They don't have a lineage. The Himalayan mountains were too high. The sufficient number of nuns did not reach Tibet. And so they have novice ordination for nuns. And that's why you know, we have uh, probably around 2,000 nuns in India, more in Nepal. Who knows how many in Tibet? Probably tens of thousands. One monastery I went to had 8,000 nuns. Now the communists have destroyed it, but almost destroyed it. But in any case, the ordination issue, we're still in dialogue. His Holiness the Dalai Lama would love to see full ordination for women in the Tibetan tradition. But unfortunately, some of the senior monks are rather conservative, and they have not agreed yet. Uh, we're still working on it. <laughs> Meanwhile, we've gone to, I went to Korea, some went to Taiwan, some went to Hong Kong, some went to Paris or LA to get the full ordination. And so there are other options. And we still practice in the Tibetan tradition and His Holiness recognizes us as fully ordained nuns in the Tibetan tradition. He said so publicly many times. So if you'd like to know more about Jamyang Foundation, our education programs, you can check out our website. Yeah, and 
If you'd like to learn more about Sakyadita, the International Association of Buddhist Women, this is the website. So I can leave this um, PowerPoint. I can send it to someone who could share it. It's a rather large file, but you're welcome to it. There are ways to, to send it if you're interested. Okay, so I'm going to uh, come back to the room. And so this is basically to say that women have the same enlightenment, same potential to achieve perfect awakening or enlightenment as all sentient beings do. There's nothing stopping us except our own minds, our own delusions. Sometimes delusions of inferiority, maybe even delusions of superiority. So many, too many delusions <laughs> that we can get rid of them because they are impermanent. So let's go for it. What's on your mind? Please feel free to share your thoughts or ask any questions you might have. Priya had a question, but I think she had to go. So let's see if anyone here has a question. If not, I can read it. So did okay. I? Okay. Yeah. I see in the chat there are a few questions. No, not just questions, just kind wishes. So nice. So what was her question before she left? She said, um, is it really true that in order for us to fully awaken that everyone else must also awaken? Wrong, wrong, wrong. No, we can fully awaken and then we can, in the state of awakening, we can help to awaken others. Take, for example, Buddha Shakyamuni. Buddha Shakyamuni, you see, there's a fallacy and it's in all the world religions books that a bodhisattva delays awakening until all sentient beings are awakened. But that's a logical fallacy because if we all waited for all sentient beings to become awakened, nobody would ever get awakened, right? Using logic. <laughs> so somebody has to go first. So they talk about three kinds of bodhisattvas. There's the king-like bodhisattva. There's the boat person-like bodhisattva. And there's the shepherd-like bodhisattva. The king-like bodhisattva goes first and takes the lead and then brings all others along. The shepherd-like bodhisattva shepherds the, everyone else ahead before them. Like you see the shepherd putting the sheep into the pen and then closing the door, yeah? And the oars person or boat person we all row together. We all travel to awakening together. So three different types. We can choose which one we would like to, to be. But even if we become fully enlightened, that doesn't mean that we ignore the sufferings of sentient beings. Of course, we're also in the enlightened state. We're also awakening and we have even more potential to aw help awaken others. Uh, having achieved perfect awakening. And I mentioned that a first stage bodhisattva, um, even at the first stage, maybe I didn't explain, but at the first stage, a bodhisattva is able to manifest 100 bodies in 100 world systems. In the second stage, bodhisattva can emanate 1,000 bodies in 1,000 world systems to benefit beings and on and on and on. Ultimately, a Buddha can manifest infinite forms in order to benefit sentient beings. So it's incremental. And you had a question? Yes. Um, my question has to do with with we vow and sincerely mean we wish to attain enlightenment to benefit all beings. But how will it benefit all beings if one of us succeeds? 
Well, because we teach the path to others. Okay, so that's the teaching. Yeah. It's by uh, teaching. Thank you. Showing the path. Yeah, showing the path. Thank but we you. cannot literally mm. enlighten them. Mm. If the Buddha could save us, we would all be saved already. Yeah. But we have to <laughs> purify our own minds. Mm. You know, we have to um, develop our own wisdom. We have to develop our own compassion. Mm. Makes sense, right? Yes. Something we struggle for is ours, right? Yes. Like our knowledge. We study for an exam. That knowledge is ours, yes. right? If we cheat on the exam, like some of my <laughs> students, they think they're so cute. They're so smart. Now with online learning, they can just copy and paste. But you know, when it comes to the essay question, it's so clear that the quiz terms might be perfect, but the essays are junk because they didn't really learn it. Yes. Right? So copy and paste doesn't work for enlightenment. <laughs> we have the template, we have the Buddha, and we have Tara, we have the exemplars of awakening. And using their lives and their teachings as a template, then we progress on the path. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, it does exist in Buddhism the term unconsciousness like in Western psychology, like the part of our mind that is dark. Um, I asked this question because many times I have uh, very difficult feelings like anguish and I don't really know from where they come. So... Yeah. I wonder if there is some uh, knowledge in Buddhism about how we can work with this part of our mind. For sure there is. Now, for us to do a, a proper discussion of consciousness, we would need another two hours. And according to my clock, we've reached our, the end of our time. But I'm happy to stay in and especially to address this question because I think it's an important one. Now, according to the Buddhists, the nature of our mind, the true nature of our mind is pure, clear knowing, right? We already established that. So where do these dark feelings come from? Where do, does our greed, where does our anger, where does our, you know, where do our delusions of incapability and so forth, where does, where is all of this coming from? These are just thoughts that arise in the mind due to habit, habit energy. Um, dark, unskillful deeds that we did in the past create an imprint on our mind. You know, maybe we harm someone in the past. If not in this lifetime, of course, we've all harmed people, even in this lifetime. But in past lifetimes, we may have harmed them more. We might have even hit them. We might have even... Um, tortured them or killed them, you see. And those create imprints on our minds. Fortunately, they're impermanent and we can purify them. We can clear them up through meditation practice. Slowly, carefully, um, diligently, we purify our minds by watching our breathing, by sending thoughts of loving kindness to all living beings. We are automatically puring, purifying our mind of those dark thoughts. The dark thoughts are not permanent. They are not indelible. And they say the pure knowing nature of the mind. It's like the pure blue sky. And the clouds come and go, come and go. So the clouds represent our thoughts, happy thoughts, mm, unhappy thoughts, but they're impermanent. They're not part of our mind. They call them adventitious thoughts. I don't know if it translates, but impermanent. Another analogy is the great ocean. The, the mind is like the great ocean, pure, clear. And the thoughts are like the waves that come and go, come and go. They disturb our minds. 
but they're not part of the mind. You see? So they come and go, come and go. As we practice on the path, the waves of delusion become weaker and weaker. The unhappy thoughts, the results of our own actions and also things that have happened to us get weaker because we replace them basically with constructive thoughts, wholesome thoughts, skillful thoughts. We can say happy thoughts. So it takes work, but it's totally possible. Check it out. So the Buddhist teachings are always like that. We don't have to believe anything. He said, come and see. Come and see. So check it out. Try even five minutes in the morning, five minutes in the evening of watching our, our breathing, being with our breathing. Even five minutes of meditation on loving kindness to all beings, morning and evening. We'll see a change. We'll see a difference. Yeah. Thank you. Give it time. Okay, be patient. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I think we'll take Madeline's question because her hand is raised. And um, this this room staying open for the next 24 hours for monitoring. So, you know, going over a little bit is okay. We got time. Yeah, feel free to leave if you need to. Of course. Yes. Uh, okay, Madeline. Hello, let's see how done. Hello, nice to see you. Thank you so much for your heart share today. I really appreciated the part about the women coming into their priesthood and being recognized and being sistered up in that way. Like I could feel the energy of what they're bringing to the world. And I just want to acknowledge that. And I can appreciate how it's happening in so many of the places that that energy is waiting for the time that everything's shared again. So my question and thought was, how are the women of the different beliefs coming together? Because I, I just know there's so much power in us being united. And every time I learn a, more deeply about a religion, I find how common some of the things are that we do reside within our hearts, you know? And I just keep believing in shared prayer as a way to kind of fully lift it up. And then I have one more thing, rites of passage for children. Like what are the types of things that are going on in the collective around helping them to kind of develop an awareness of their nature, being of the elements and of the ground and using it in that way. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Um, yes, the women of the different uh, wisdom traditions are coming together in some really wonderful ways, both on the local level, the national level, and the international level. I'll give you some examples. Um, one is the Parliament of World Religions which happens, it used to happen every 100 years, then it happened every five years, now it's happening more often. And I've attended three of them, and they have a women's, um, yeah, a whole women's section, caucus. Wow. Oh, yeah. And uh, so women are very prominent at the Parliament of World Religions, uh, from many different traditions, and it's beautiful yeah. to see. And we encourage each other, and um, we're, some of us are working together on various projects, like they're putting together a book. And currently, my chapter is long overdue. <laughs> but we're putting together a third book in a series. And uh -huh. this particular book is about women who participated in the Parliament of World Religions. And these mm -hmm. books are open access. I can send you the links. And it's Wonderful. very inspiring to see. Um, um, on the local level, some women got together and did such a book in San Diego. And of course, it's available on Amazon, like everything else. Uh, I'm boycotting Amazon, but that's okay. You can still find it there and, and order it. And then um, among scholars, there's also a lot of uh, dialogue going on at the um, American Academy of Religion. Uh, it's a scholarly forum that happens every year, and it's the largest professional conference in the world with 1,000 delegates. And wow. these days, about half of them are women, and they have special women's caucus. 
And the Women's Caucus has sometimes five or six different sessions where they share their publications, they mentor one another, um, they have, um, yeah, um, they present their research on women in different faith traditions, mm -hmm. and they've also produced many books. And they'll also have like a, a book session. People who have published books on women can present their books to women of other traditions. So there's a lot, so much happening. It's unbelievable. Even at my school, which is a Catholic university, they'll put on forums like women in the pulpit women in, you know, like, or they'll, they'll call um, priests in heels, <laughs> right? And things like this, where people come together and share, uh, compare notes and encourage yeah. one another. So there's a lot Wonderful. going on. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. More about, um, I got carried away. What was your second question? Well, no, I'll wait. I don't want to take the time. I've, I'm going to come back to Hawaii. I was just there and I'll be going back and I'll, I'll get more involved in that way. But just about children, I was, my last thing was just about okay. rites of passage, just to implement our you know, new awarenesses that we've all come to. So our children are learning something the same and not being split apart by all the different learnings. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. So children, uh, practices for children. I usually pointed the example of Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, who's written over a hundred books, um, including Peace in Every Step, which I use in my classes. We're gonna do this every, next week. Peace mm -hmm. in, is in every step. And he has, you know, the miracle of mindfulness. He has, um, you know, present moment, wonderful moment. So many lovely, simple, clear, practical books. And he does meditations with children like three minute meditations. He gets the little kids meditating, like I showed you one photo from Nepal, and he gets the little kids meditating and they, he teaches them simple songs. Breathing in, breathing out, breathing in, breathing out. And they sing it. And he does other cute little exercises like they'll take a flower and then one child will Pass the flower to the next child. A lotus for you, Buddha to be. And then that kid will pass it to the next one. A lotus for you, Buddha to be. And they'll go around and circle. So he has many different activities. Yeah, there. beautiful. I mean, the nuns also came up with many of these. It's not just mm -hmm. he has a whole mm -hmm. order of nuns, the order of interbeing. And they have monasteries in France and in San Diego and Vermont and uh, Thailand and all over the place. Interbeing, interbeing. Order of interbeing. Nice. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for the shares and for all the pictures and all of it. Thank you. So um, normally we end with a few moments of loving kindness meditation. Uh, if we have time, shall we do a loving kindness meditation? Absolutely. Okay. Then again, please sit comfortably. Content in your body. Completely relaxed. And imagine yourself filled with loving kindness. We do this by imagining loving kindness in the form of a gentle golden light that fills up every molecule, every atom of our body and our mind. Displacing all unhappy thoughts, all dark thoughts, all thoughts of inadequacy or regrets, let it all go. And instead, fill yourself with this gentle light of loving kindness.
pure loving kindness. Then share this loving kindness with everyone in your living space and everyone on this call, our community. Imagine each and every one of them completely filled with this golden light of loving kindness. And expand your loving kindness to include everyone in the town where you're living. People you know, the people you don't know, people you like, the people you don't like so much. Imagine each and every one of them equally filled with loving kindness. Extend your loving kindness out even further to everyone in the state or province where you're living, including all the animals, birds, insects, every living creature. Imagine them all completely filled with loving kindness. Extending out even further, imagine everyone in the country where you're living, completely filled with loving kindness. And finally, expand your loving kindness to everyone in the whole world. Remembering especially those who are suffering from hunger and thirst. Cold and heat. from homelessness and incarceration. Conflicts and torture. From sickness and approaching death. loneliness and depression. And anxiety and feelings of hopelessness. Imagine them all completely filled with loving kindness.
May they all be happy. May they all be peaceful. May they all be free from suffering. So we conclude our gathering today by rejoicing in the merit that we have accumulated, listening to the teachings, contemplating the teachings, putting the teachings into practice. And we dedicate the merit of all these practices the benefit of all living beings. virtue of the merit that we have accumulated, may we achieve the state of perfect awakening in order to liberate all living beings from suffering, leaving not one behind. Thank you.